Now, the theme of this particular session uh, asks us to put three uh, really complex terms into some kind of relation to each other, uh, the visual, the spatial, and the urban. Uh, so what I want to do in the next half hour is to begin with visuality and spatiality uh, and to make some rather, in the time available, I think some rather schematic remarks about how I understand those things and how I, I think about them in, in relation to each other. I then want to offer uh, some thoughts on the current urban configuration of those terms, which I think in many parts of many cities across the world now uh, is also a digital configuration. And then finally, uh, I want to offer some thoughts towards a more nuanced vocabulary uh, to engage with that configuration, or what, of course, I should now call a, re a refiguration of this digital uh, urban uh, visual uh, space. So, uh, let me start then by thinking about the relationship between the visual uh, and the spatial. Now, the two, I think, are very often conflated. There's an assumption that somehow we can always see space, that space is visible somehow, and that the visual field is also always spatially organized. But as uh, Lacan remarked in one of his seminars, uh, a blind person can have an excellent understanding of space. And I think what that tells us is that the visual and spatial should be understood as two different registers of experience. There are two ways in which the world might be organized. So there's the visual register, what's rendered seeable and how through certain kinds of color or light and so on. And there's the spatial register, how the world is organized in terms of depth, volume, boundaries, and so on. And while certain kinds of space may indeed be seeable in particular ways, uh, others uh, may not. So uh, take, uh, for example, uh, uh, the case of driverless cars. Now, driverless cars, uh, technolo new technology being experimented with in many uh, urban uh, sit uh, situations now, um, have cameras. But they also uh, create... Um, uh, I'm already falling into the problem I want to uh, challenge. They always get images uh, through laser scanning. These are LIDAR-generated images of what driverless cars see. Now, LIDAR is not a visual technology. It's a spatial technology which tells the car where other objects are in relation to it. But as humans, we seem compelled to want to know how a car sees, and so we translate that spatial technology into these kind of visuals. Uh, we have to add somehow this dark background with the neon color uh, to be able to claim that we are looking at what the car also sees. I think what this demonstrates is that this, this translation of a spatial technology into a visual image uh, is that the visual and the spatial, as, as I've been saying, uh, are not the same. So instead, then, we might think of spatialities and visualities as registers of mediation. And Kemba and Zelinska talk about mediation as a key trope for understanding and articulating our being in and becoming with the technological world, our emergence and ways of interacting with it, as well as the acts and processes of temporarily stabilizing the world into media, agents, relations, and networks. So for me, the visual and spatial are not simply experiential or sensory, visual, and kinesthetic sensations, because they also have quite specific formations, geometries, lines of sight, and so on. And these formations happen with and through technologies and practices. As Kemba and Zielinska go on to say, mediation is a multi-agential force uh, that incorporates humans and machines, technologies and users, in an ongoing process of becoming with. Uh, and here, if I had more time, I would branch out into thinking um, about the work of Rosa Brodotti, uh, or rather differently, Catherine Hales, and their arguments that this kind of incorporation of the human with the machine is uh, uh, producing a, a new moment of, of the post-human, as they call. The human understood through and with the technological, emergent alongside them, diversely uh, and in differentiated ways. So how we see and spatialize, I would argue, is co-emergent with these technologies. Now, I've mentioned practices there also, technologies and practices. Actually, I think I'm beginning to move away from the notion of practice and perhaps want to uh, go back to the, the terminology uh, of labor to think about what, what is done by post-humans with, uh, with technologies. Uh, labor that's extraordinarily diverse, situated and emplaced. And here I'm inspired by recent feminist scholarship by uh, people like Lisa Parks, uh, Quee, Greg and Crawford who insist on holding on to a notion of labor as a means of emphasizing the doing of digital technologies, their designing, their programming, their fantasizing, using, breaking, modding, and so on, which are done by particular places, particular people, embedded in different kinds of relations, corporate, domestic, public, whatever, 
all following specific conventions and codes to make meaning or play or profit, experiments, dreams, uh, and, and so on. And for me, this notion of labor speaks rather more directly to the relations between different people doing things with, with technologies, uh, and then can therefore perhaps allow us to speak rather more directly about some of the power relations that are embedded in, in, this, sort of, uh, in this current moment. So what then about the digital specifically, and how might we think about the distinctiveness of digital technologies and digitally mediated urban spaces? Well, I want to suggest uh, that digital images that show us pictures of cities, in cities, uh, have four uh, characteristics. And their first characteristic is their sheer mass. You know, there are now simply enormous numbers of images uh, of, of very many uh, different kinds. Uh, and this was very evident to me in the uh, recent research project that Angela mentioned, uh, looking at uh, a range of different kinds of, of smart projects uh, in the UK uh, city of Milton Keynes. Now, digital images of many kinds are absolutely central to all aspects of the smart city. So, uh, to uh, use an image, different version we saw yesterday, uh, the screens in a smart city's operations centre, like Rio de Janeiro's here, uh, show a very wide range of images from CCTV camera feeds to key performance indicator traffic lights. Uh, and here's an example from another smart city uh, of a real-time online data feed from a local flood alert network. This happens to be from Oxford in, in the UK. There are also huge numbers of other sorts of images screened on uh, various kinds of screens, uh, like this uh, open data portal uh, for London, uh, it's much more atmospheric, we might say, sit, uh, uh, visions of what smart cities will look like. Uh, this is uh, Paris in 2050, you'll be interested to know. Um, uh, and these sorts of images circulate on social media, in kind of grey literatures, they're printed on expo stands, uh, they appear in adverts for smart city uh, tech, uh, and they also merge into rather less photorealistic, kind of perhaps inspired more by kind of traditions of science fiction movies and book covers, um, and there's also a, a very strong strand in smart city visuals of, of, of kind of graphic, um, kind of pedagogic uh, sort of images which are explaining to us what a smart city uh, is and does. Now, all these images, of course, being digital, are highly mobile. Uh, they move through what we might say trajectorial space, uh, I think was the term uh, Martina and Hubert mentioned yesterday. So as Rubenstein and Sluss uh, remark, a digital image is always a networked image. Images appear on multiple screens in different forms at different sites. They're shared and favorited, liked and deleted, copied and posted. So the scale as well as the mobility of image production uh, is enacting a shift from the singular image, they suggest, to the image field, the image pool or, or the image sequence. Uh, and I want to come back to that. Now, lots of uh, these images are also highly mutable. They can be made, and then they can be remade, uh, amended uh, in various ways. Uh, and here, are, uh, the work of Herzl and Marie on the soft image, I think, is particularly useful. They suggest now that digital imagery is a program, while, my, while they may still appear as a geometrical projection on our screens, are now, in fact, inextricably mixed up with the data and the continuous processing of data. What was supposed to be a solid representation of a solid world based on the sound principle of geometric projection, a hard image, as it were, they suggest, is now something completely different. Ubiquitous, infinitely adaptable and adaptive, and intrinsically merged with software, a soft image. And because it's a, a soft image, it's digital, an image file can be materialized in many different ways. Uh, it, it can be printed, uh, materialized in all sorts of forms and, and, and media. Uh, and that's, I think, a very important aspect of, of, of digital imagery as well. Now, I want to elaborate on the implications uh, of this account uh, by showing you uh, a digital animation, uh, again, which offers us another vision of what cities uh, will look like in, in 2050. Uh, it has a soundtrack and a voiceover, but I'm just going to let it uh, run while I speak, um, and we can you know, uh, discuss it in a little more detail uh, afterwards. I'm sure you, you'll have different reactions to it. Um, this is a, a video made by um, a digital visualization studio uh, for Siemens, uh, and it's on display in Siemens uh, exhibition space uh, in London. And I want to suggest uh, by looking at this that we're not simply being asked to see a city of the future, we're also being asked to um, uh, uh, enter a particular kind of digitally mediated urban space through uh, these, this kind of animation with a certain kind of geometry and a certain kind of aesthetic. And I apologize for the, um, 
uh, the jerkiness, <laughs> which uh, I will come back to, um, and also the rather poor resolution. It's very high res uh, when you see the actual thing. So, uh, it's made by um, a, a company called ISO, who describe themselves as a content design and development studio. And they're not unusual among such com companies in employing live action directors, two and three D animators, graphic and interface designers, script writers, software developers, social media managers and producers. Uh, they produce uh, digital media, interactive software and immersive installations for a whole range of, of, of kind of genres. Uh, and for a wide range of clients. Uh, in other words, to use the more succinct phrasing of their Twitter page, they are digital experience designers. And to create future life, they shot film, they added CGI model buildings, which were designed in collaboration with uh, an architecture practice, and, and live action composited sequences. <laughs> this this is, uh, should be much smoother. Um, which is the whole point of my analysis of the paper, <laughs> so it's rather ironic it's not happening. Um, now, ISO are actually based in Glasgow, in fact, uh, but I do want to point out that the production of this very kind of high-end digital animation uh, has a very clear global division of labour, which the very expensive visualisation studios almost entirely uh, in, in uh, northwestern Europe uh, and, and certain cities in the States uh, spend a lot of time and energy trying to uh, uh, maintain uh, their, their uh, elite place in, in this uh, uh, creative global div uh, division of labour. And they are using digital technology to visualize cities that run smoothly, efficiently, sustainably because of digital tech. Uh, and there are huge numbers of these sorts of images around which show us these clean, white, green cities. I think Jenny showed us uh, a vision of this from London yesterday, uh, which are not uh, buggy, brittle, and hackable, um, to just use Rob Kitchen's uh, a verdict of what uh, smart cities are, are most likely to be, in fact. Of course, we have here a buggy uh, viewing of, of this particular animation. So there are no breakdowns in these cities. There's always sunshine. It's always lovely and pleasant. Uh, and actually, I think it's very easy to get to that kind of representational critique of this sort of animation. But I think also uh, what this digital visualization technology allows is a certain spatial organization to be seen, where things flow smoothly, um, where we see things traveling smoothly, but also as a viewer, we are taken through an endlessly moving point of view, seeing things that themselves constantly morph and flow into other things. There are very few jump cuts in this uh, animation. Um, uh, and I want to say a little bit more about how this fits into uh, my description of, of uh, digital imagery now. Well, I described four qualities previously, uh, mass, multimedia, mobile, and mutable. And I, I, I kind of positioned those as, as qualities of the massive images themselves. But I think what interests me uh, in this um, uh, presentation is that it also uh, enacts those kind of qualities uh, in, uh, in its um, uh, visual and spatial form. So we're shown uh, in this animation a very wide range of images from architectural photography, maps, massing models, aerial photography, and holograms. We might think that as, as, as a kind of form of multimediality. And each type of image constantly morphs and mutates into another. So as I've said, there's a kind of mutability uh, uh, going on here. And the viewpoint uh, is also constantly mobile, zooming and sweeping in and out. Now, that kind of spatial organization, I think, should be understood as distinctively digital. And here I want to draw on, a, on an essay in 3D, on 3D cinema uh, by Thomas Alsacer, who uh, discuss, uh, discusses the sort of space through which this animation is structured. He suggests it has historical precursors in earlier efforts at three-dimensional visualizations, which were interestingly also often of cities. Uh, things like panoramas, models, stereoscopes, 3D cinemas. And he argues that we should understand the recent popularity of 3D films, not just as the latest gimmick by sort of the Hollywood system to get us back into cinemas, although it's probably also that, but rather as the latest in a long and persistent line of efforts to create immersive visual experiences. He describes this as post-pictorial, aiming towards the elimination of the frame. 3D cinema, he says, no longer assumes monocular perspective and the framed image, Rather, it introduces the malleability, scalability, fluidity, and curvature of digital images into audiovisual space, doing away with horizons, suspending vanishing points, seamlessly varying distance, unchaining the camera and transporting the observer. 
And he argues that this new form of spectatorship parallels our everyday absorption in digital images on all sorts of screens and, and describes it as the new default value of digital vision. Uh, and I think you only need to uh, think about the, the you know, constant zooming and sweeping and in and out uh, when you go to any kind of Hollywood uh, uh, sort of movie now, particularly the, all the, you know, the kind of superhero films. And you know, I think almost without exception, you know, most of those characters do things in spaces that humans you know, couldn't, um, to just, just to get a sense of, uh, of, the, of the sort of power uh, of, of this kind of um, uh, default value. And I just want to add something to that in passing, and I'll say more about this a little later on. Drawing on feminist scholars like Susanna Parsonen and Jodie Dean, I think it's also important to flag here that the, the effect uh, of this kind of uh, spatial uh, animation uh, also involves circuits of desire and affect. Um, uh, and they talk about the way, uh, on social media in particular, um, it's, it's driven by a kind of continuous search for the most seductive uh, image I I in a stream. Uh, and, and the visual aesthetics are very important to that. Um, and I think the colours uh, and, and the lighting uh, in this animation uh, is also crucial, and I will return to that uh, before the end of my talk. Now, as I say, I think it's quite easy to um, uh, make criticisms and indeed to find criticisms of the representational qualities of these images of future digital cities. Uh, uh, and also, of course, critiques of the whole notion of the idea of the smart city as a kind of technocratic, neoliberal uh, nightmare. So here's a very small example uh, from uh, the Bangkok Post a year or two ago, with again one of those classic digital visuals, you know, the cool greens and greys and, and, and blues, uh, uh, talking about a smart initiative uh, in a, um, a city in Thailand, and the response on Twitter uh, talking about the way in which this will never happen in, uh, uh, in Thailand. Now, these sorts of criticisms tend to focus on questions, as I say, of visual content and representation. I think that's really important and necessary particularly because a lot of smart hype continues to visibilize certain bodies in particular kinds of ways. So it, it distresses me deeply the way in which we're looking at these cities, uh, you know, in, uh, I don't know, 50 years in the future, and it's still women who are always next to the kids who, looking, uh, who need looking after. If there's an old person in the image, it's always in the context of them needing health care and how digital health care can help them when, you're, you know, when they are ill, because to be old is also apparently to be ill. And of course, um, uh, there's uh, significant work emerging now on the way in which um, the way uh, smart technologies uh, in the form of surveillance uh, absolutely uh, surveil urban spaces and produce highly uh, racialized um, uh, divisions uh, uh, of embodiment. But it seems to me that these sorts of digital images also invite a specific bodily enactment of urbanity, this constant movement, this smooth, friction-free mobility, this flowing and glowing. So I think we also need to develop uh, a different kind of critique, one that can address this flow and glow, this embodied, uh, affective, uh, um, spatially uh, and visually uh, mediated urbanism. And I think also it's important to try to do that from within this f configuration uh, of the digital um, I think a lot of critical scholarship, certainly in geography that I read at the moment around the smart city, seems to think it's possible simply to reject the idea of smart entirely uh, and to step away. You know, they position it as corporate. They want to step away uh, and invent a kind of grassroots, community-based uh, digital urbanism, which, of, of course, is, is great. Um, but I think also you know, there are other dynamics uh, going on in, in the digitally mediated uh, city, uh, this being one of them that we also need to pay uh, a lot of attention to, I think. And in doing that, I think we need quite a nuanced spatial and visual vocabulary, one that can engage with the digital visual and not simply dismiss it as either so trivial, you know, all those selfies on, on Twitter or, you know, Instagram, uh, or a uh, spectacle. Oh, we can just, it's just silly. We don't need to pay attention to it. And here I found uh, a range of, of uh, recent scholarship really productive. Uh, Simone Brown's book on dark matters, Anna Munster talking about an seizure of networks, Hito Stiles' book on the wretched of the screen and Deborah Withers' Feminism, Digital Culture and the Politics of Transmission. And with those authors, I want to think about this huge, vast, unimaginable uh, number of digital images that are made, uploaded, shared, circulated, and so on, as a kind of field or, or a constellation. To quote Withers, uh, it's a stratified constellation of technical memory matter, uh, composed of resources that shape political and cultural imaginaries with depth, 
height, scale, extensiveness, and duration, and we might talk more about the temporalities uh, of this in, in, uh, at the end, moving in different directions. Its forms may change and content migrate, accruing or shedding textures in the process. So bits of this field will appear on multiple screens in different forms at different sites as they're shared, favorited, liked, copied, and posted. And this scale of image production is, as I've said, enacting uh, a shift from the singular image uh, to the image sequence, the image pool, the field, uh, the feed, something more akin to live transmission. So as images get posted to a platform like Twitter, they're made serial as they're retweeted, as they travel from screen to screen. Um, and this generative circulation of images suggests that an image now is just a tentative view of a database. It's the actualization of network data, including questions of, of access, transfer, update, and refresh. So the image field through which the smart city, of any city now, becomes visible is less a population of representations and more a constantly emergent, transient, conjunctural field with many kinds of images appearing and disappearing as feeds, refresh, searches complete, and screens are swiped. Now that field and that sense of its differentiation and, and the notion of kind of constellations, uh, access, and so on, I think really means that we need to think about uh, cultural and social labor, you know, who is doing this, uh, with what, what, to what ends. But also, uh, we need to pay attention to algorithmic agency, of course. Uh, John Hartley pointed out some time ago now that in this kind of immense digital field, processes of, processes of selection, management, order, and redaction become particularly important to pay attention to. Uh, and Louisa Moore has a new book coming out on, on algorithmic uh, image recognition, which is fantastic. I'm lucky enough to have a sneak preview, so I, I urge you to look out for that, thinking about how uh, the algorithms start to sort and shift this visual field. Um, but also there are things that, uh, that uh, Tylestrop and Thielman call infrastructural images, which are the thumbnails that we so often use to, to try and search our way through something like uh, a Google image search. So, as I say, what I want to try and do is configure this field, not so much as a network, which I think, as Munster says, assumes a certain kind of flatness as things travel between points, but rather think about things being made somewhere, uploaded, traveling somewhere else, being reconfigured, perhaps analyzed and multiplied, and then uh, downloaded, perhaps to the same device, perhaps to many others, in the same place or elsewhere. And I think that sense of things moving through something uh, begins, to, again, to, to speak to questions of a kind of power and, and differentiation uh, and productivity uh, in this uh, constellation. Simone Brown talks about the way in which data, and her particular example is CCTV, surveillance footage uh, in, in the US, are assembled in one place but then reassembled in other, often elsewhere. And for her, that's about mediations and remediations and, and particularly speaks to the intense surveillance directed uh, at black bodies in, in post-slavery uh, US. So, as I say, I think um, this, this language can start to begin to, to address these questions uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of, of power and, and differentiation. And it also uh, encourages us, I think, to think about the kind of materializations of images rather differently too, the screens or, or the billboards or the book pages or whatever it is that, you know, where we encounter uh, a particular image. Um, uh, Francesco Cassetti, in his great book on digital cinema, talks about the way we have to think now of screens as transit hubs, for images that circulate in our social space. Um, they make them momentarily available um, before they embark again on their journey. Uh, so screens function as the junctions of a complex circuit, characterized by, by continuous flow and localized processes of configuration and reconfiguration. So what I'm urging us to do then, I guess, is to take that flow seriously, to travel with it, to go with it, to see where it flows, where indeed it doesn't, where it congeals, where it remixes, and what emerges from that. You know, where are particular servers and screens? What happens there? What are the consequences? Because as images circulate in contemporary visual culture, there are, to quote Anna Munster, microprocesses of visualization that form relays, captures, and releases that resonate to compositionally produce emerging socio-technical ensembles. So within this febrile, constantly emergent field, these concatenations and clusterings that more or less hold I think are best understood as what Munster calls established affective territories. Specific assemblages move and enable. They have certain forms of push. They, they uh, enable um, certain kinds of feelings, gestures, individuals, collectives to emerge. A glance at a stream of images on a smartphone screen may, for example, focus rather little on their detailed content, you know, 
semiotics, therefore, becomes rather passé. Uh, but they might be very attuned uh, to their atmosphere, their colours, their disposition towards navigation, perhaps, uh, drawing on the work of Nana Verhoff here. Or perhaps to moods like aspiration or entrapment. Uh, and there's fantastic work by Rangaswamy and Aurora and Sundaram on the ways in which Facebook is used uh, in uh, uh, informal settlements uh, in India. And this is where I want to return in my final uh, comments to the question of the visual more directly, and the visual in particular as light and as colour. Now again, I want to think here about the ways in which uh, digital images both show us light uh, and when those high-end visualisers are producing those very um, uh, detailed uh, animations uh, still, uh, and still uh, uh, computer-generated images. The, the, the way the light falls and, and trying to get the light right is where they put huge amounts of effort and energy. Um, but also, of course, when we see uh, digital images, they are so often on screens, they are also generating light in their very materialization, in their form. And Caroline Kane's history of digital color talks a lot about the way it's distinctive in what she calls its stunning intensity. She talks about the way many urban environments now are decked from head to toe in electronic hues, in luminous screensavers, brightly colored multi-screen installations in shopping malls, airports, airplanes, gyms, and cars. And Amin and Strift have talked about the ways in which the variation and intensity of luminosity and colour uh, is one of the affective infrastructures uh, in their sense of the, the contemporary and, and the emergent city. Now, I think the question of colour is, is really uh, an interesting one, you know, theoretically uh, very intriguing. Um, uh, I think it can be approached certainly uh, as culturally specific, and we can talk about the ways in which different colours are coded with different cultural values and a kind of representational moment. But I think we can also think about colour uh, as what Kathleen Stewart calls compositional. Colour, in and of itself, can push because of what it weaves together and what it congeals through it. For Stewart, colour is an energetics of form. And it's another means, I think, of tracking the ways in which the digital visual uh, congeals and constellates in particular ways. Uh, and here I want to show you uh, an experiment I did using uh, a piece of software um, available uh, through Lev Manovich's software studies initiative. Uh, these are uh, 9,000 uh, images attached to a number of smart city related tweets. Uh, a couple of years ago, I scraped off of a colleague of mine scraped off of Twitter over a couple of weeks. Um, if we had a high-res screen, uh, you would see a little more clearly that they cluster into, it's a colour wheel, and they cluster into two zones, blue and orange, uh, and, uh, and, and kind of red, uh, red and indigo, uh, uh, blue and indigo. Um, and I think there's something there about doing smart by being or, or, orange or blue that deserves more attention, rather than, oh, you know, orange is warm and blue is cold. And, but, you know, it, it's a kind of, yeah, there's a something, uh, there's an energetics and, and a congealing there that I think is intriguing. And in this kind of fire, my effort at sort of trying to um, uh, develop a, uh, an analytical vocabulary here and indeed to try to experiment with methods that might address other aspects of images other than their visual, uh, their, their, uh, their representational content specifically, the final term I would just want to pose very briefly is the notion of, of X visibility uh, in my subtitle. Now, I'm not really sure what that means, <laughs> but I'm inspired because I think we need a much more a uh, nuanced vocabulary to think about the visual than simply whether something is visible or not. Um, and the idea often Im implicit in that is that if something is, is invisible, it's bad, because it's like Google hiding things and, and Facebook. We don't know what they're doing with our data. It's bad. It's a data shadow. It's a, um, whereas open data, open, visible, is, is good. Uh, that's certainly, a, I mean, I'm caricaturing, but that's an assumption, I think, certainly a lot of the geographical literature around smart cities at the moment. I think things are way more complicated than that in the digital field. And again, Simone Brown pushes us to thinking towards this. Uh, she uses the term unvisibility in her book on black surveillance uh, in, in US cities. And unvisibility for her, if I understand her rightly, is the, is the paradigmatic position of the black body in the US, which is rendered almost invisible because people really don't care <laughs> about black bodies except in moments of crisis when they become hyper-visible and spectacularised. So unvisible is her ter a term for this kind of, I don't know quite how to, a kind of cusp moment of, of being both visible and invisible both and neither at, at the same time. And I think that's the kind of much more nuanced vocabulary we need to start thinking through if we're really to grasp some of the challenges that this digital, uh, visual, cultural 
uh, urban moment is offering us. And in particular, uh, if we have to start thinking much more directly about the power relations that are embedded in, in, in all of this. Uh, and on that final note, my final slide uh, is this one. Thank you very much. <laughs>